Hello and welcome to this video of the course Answers at Solving in Practice where we are going to do this exercise 1E of the grounding part of the course. Here we have this encoding that solves the satisfiability problem where an instance contains some atoms, some clauses, and these are the literals of those clauses. So the first literal just says that A must hold, the second, so the first clause just says that A must hold. The second says that either A does not hold or B holds. And the third one says that either B does not hold or C holds. And we are given the fact that A holds. Then this first rule basically allows us to choose an assignment to the different atoms. We have this cycle through negation here that allows us to make that choice. And here we have that a clause is satisfied if some literal in it has the appropriate value. And then we eliminate the solutions with this integrity constraint if there's some clause that is not satisfied. Okay, so let's go to it. I have written here the program and the facts, just using shorter names for the predicate predicates. So let's start with this. We call this rule R1, this R2, and this R3. And we begin by drawing the dependency graph. So rule R1 defines the atom H that occurs here in the body. So then we have this link from R1 to R2, and this is positive. But it's important to realize that we also have here the not H in the very same rule. So then we have a loop from R1 to itself, and it, this is a negative loop because the atom in the body is preceded by negation. And then here from R2, we also go to R3 with a negative edge because here this defines S, and here we have not S, right? So then the dependency graph is just this R1 to itself, R2, R3, oops, to R3. And formally, we have GP equals P, comma, R1 to R1, R1 to R2, and R2 to R3. And then in this case, the strongly connected components are, consist each of one rule. So then the program, and in this case, <coughs> it's clear that the top, there's a unique topological order that goes first with R1, then with R2, and then with R3. Okay. Now let's get here the positive dependency graph. And we have here this edge from R1 oops, to R2. And there's no link to R3, right? So here we just take this edge. And we can also write it like this. P... And then we just have the edge R1 to R2. Good. And then here, there's only one topological order that we can choose because here there's one, a unique topological order, and these are all singleton sets. So we have to choose the same here for this LP, right? And now what is left to do is to select the value of R of R1 and R or F of R2 and R of R3. So we have to see whether in R1 we have to check the negative literals and here we just have these two. And we have to see whether the atom that occurs negated occurs in the same rule or in later rules. And indeed, this is the case here in R1, right? Because the atom that is negated appears in the head. So then we have to protect these from simplifications. So we can write here, oops, this to protect this atom in the body from simplifications. And R2 has no negative literals in the body. And R3 has some literal uh, negative literal in the body, but it does not appear in the head or in any later rule in our order, right? So then these are empty. Good. So then we have, this means we have to be careful when we ground this rule not to simplify these uh, negative literals. Because this very same rule is going, may give us instances of, of, of these atoms. 
So if initially we assume that they all are false, we may get wrong results because this very same rule may give us, may make some of those atoms possible. Good. Okay. So then we have the positive dependency, the dependency graph, the positive dependency graph, the order LP, and then all the values of the R. So now let's move on to build the ground instantiation. I've cleaned this a bit, deleting here all the information about the dependency graph. And yet here we have to take care about the fact that we have this order, which is exactly the order in which we have given the rules and that we should not simplify this literal here in the first rule. So let's start with this. So initially we have the facts I, and those are all the possible atoms. And we have to start by grounding this initial rule. And here, so we can start first saying, how can we ground the A? Let's start now with the opposite, that we just have two possible values for it. So we can have opposite neck pause. And then we have to choose some value for the A, and we have the atoms A, B, and C. And then with this, we have the and, uh, substitution for all variables, right? So then we can get here A of A, and then we have not H of B2 of the second and the A. So not H of pos we have to write. Pos comma A, and in the head we have the H of the V1, which is the first here, so neck and the A, right? So we have H, neck, A. Okay, and then what we can do is stick with this first ground, all the options that we have with this up, neck, pose, and try all the atoms. So then we can have here a atom B, up, neck, pose, and atom C up, neck, pose. And then, so here we will get H, pose, B, not H, pose, C, right? Again, here we have this because here we have this. And then here appears the same atom. And then in the head, we have H, neck B and H neck C. Okay. And now, so we have done for, with op neck pose all the possible values for the A, right? And now we have to do with the other. So basically we have to, to, to consider op pose neck instead of this. So basically we have to replace these values of pose and neck. Then we will have H pose A if A of A op pose neck and not H neck A, right? So here what I have used is this atom that is possible. In fact, it's, it's a fact. And then with the atom A that we get from there. And we do similarly for the atoms B, and then with C. Good. So then clearly all these are facts, so we can get rid of them. And what else do we have? So we now just have predicates about H. So here we have H post A, then this makes this rule uninteresting. So we don't have to ground it because we already have the fact H post A. And then also here, this atom, this rule will only be, uh, can prove this if H post A doesn't hold, but we have the fact, so it can never be the case that H post A doesn't hold, then it doesn't make sense to ground this rule. And now, if we were a bit blind here, we could say, look, 
And here this atom of pos B, pos C, neg B, and neg C, they are not even possible because they do not occur in our set I. Then we could simplify them because they have to be false. But this would be incorrect because actually this, this uh, precisely this rule can give us, this can give me this atom there, and this rule can give me the atom there, and similarly here, you see? And the way, so we cannot simplify these literals. And the way we can do it in a more automatic way is just looking, hey, here I have this set R that tells me that I cannot simplify this literal there. Then I have to keep these things as they are. And then from here, we get these four rules. Now, if we look at them, basically what you see is that we have this loop, right? That neg of b if not pos of b, if pos of b if not neg of b. So this allows us to choose the truth value of the atom b and similarly for the c here. Good. Okay, so then now let's move on and, and uh, let's consider here below. Let me keep here like this. So now the facts are the same as before. But now the possible atoms also have this H neck B and H neck C and what else? H post P and H post C, right? And now we have to ground this rule. So we have to see what are the possible values of this. And uh, I think we can just start by seeing, by grounding the rules with, with DL, because this will give us uh, substitutions for all the value, the variables C, V, and A. Well, if we start with this, then we still have to guess a value for the C. Not to guess, we still have to choose a value for the C. So then let's do now, we have these five. So we will have also five instances here that afterwards we will simplify. So with the first one, with the second one, the third one, and then we just can take from the VA, HVA here, H post C, and then if we have this C, we have satisfied of C in the head. Good. Okay, so clearly the, let's simplify this all our fact. So we can simplify them. And let's see, now we have about all this all this S that do, did not appear before, and let's see what, so we cannot do anything about them, let's see what can we do about the H here. So we have H post A, that is a fact, then we can derive that S1 is also a fact. And then also we can do something with this rule because H neg A is not even possible, right? It's not here and it was not also there in the set of facts that we have initially. And this makes sense because we have the fact that tells us that A holds. So then we cannot have that A doesn't hold. So we can, but the, like the, the technical way of seeing this and the way the algorithm would realize this is just by checking that this does not belong to the set of possible atoms, so it would never generate this ground rule. And then we are left with this fact and with these ground rules that tell us that if B holds, then 2 is satisfied, and if either B does not hold or C holds, then 3 is, is satisfied. And from just from here, we know that 1 will be satisfied, of course, because we have the fact that tells us that A holds, and for two, then there's no way, the only way of satisfying it is if B holds. Okay, good. So then now uh, what we get from here is that now S1 is a fact and S1, 2, 1, 3 are possible. 
So let's write it here. We have to add here the fact as one. So because close one is satisfied. And then for the possible ones, we have everything that was possible before. Oops, here, let me write it correctly. Neck B, neck C, pause B, and pause C. And these together with S, 1, 2, 3, right? Because this is what we have obtained now that they all are possible. And now we just have this rule. And this style we have, let's have a look before here. So we have that uh, it can be the case that a clause is not satisfied. So we can see all the possible values for, for this atom C and these are one, two, three. And so then we ground it for those values of the uppercase C one, two, three, and then we see what simplifications we can do. So then this is, it. oops, sorry for this. Let's stay here. It can be the case that we have C1 and not S1. It can be the case that we have C2 and not S2. And it can be the case that we have C3 and not S3, right? And now here we can apply some simplifications. Of course, these are facts, so we can get rid of them. And now here, this literal can never be satisfied because S1 is a fact, so we can get rid of this one. And then we are just, and then S2, S2 and S3, they are not facts because they do not appear here, but they are possible. Then there's nothing else we can do with this, and we keep these two integrity constraints. And then at the end, given that this is an integrity constraint, it doesn't contribute to the set of facts or possible atoms, then the set that we have in the end is the set of facts and possible atoms is exactly the one that we had before. So, and now it's always useful here once we have ground the program to see whether this is into, whether the results are what we expected. And this is useful for you to check the results, right? So here we had this rule that allows us to choose the values for H for the different atoms, but we had the fact that A must be positive. Then what we only have are the atoms to make the choice, the rules to make the choices over the atoms B and C. And this is what we would expect. Then we have here this rule that tells us when a clause is satisfied. And looking here at the first clause, the first clause would be satisfied if A is positive, and we have the fact. So it makes sense that we can derive already that first clause is satisfied. While for the second, we have that it, uh, the clause is satisfied if A does not hold or B holds. So given that we have the fact that tells us that A hold, there's no way to derive this. So then it makes sense that we have a rule that tells us that the, that the second clause is satisfied if B holds and nothing else. So this is the only option for sec the second clause to be satisfied. And for the third clause, we have the two options of being satisfied, either if B does not hold or if C holds, right? And this is to be expected. And then for the integrity constraint, um, we only have to care about the case about clauses two and three because the first one is satisfied for sure for the re because of the reasoning we have done before. So in the end, it makes sense that we just have these two ground instantiations. And also you can check here that then you derive that one is satisfied and then in the possible atom, you have all the facts here with the one plus the other heads of the rules that we have obtained that are not facts. Okay, and then you can come here and check it. Good. So then this finishes this exercise. I hope you have enjoyed it and you have understood it. So see you in another video. Ciao.